Warwick here with the skinny on wind and climate. Wind, it's this super cool natural occurrence that occurs on our earth that is often underestimated in its importance, okay? Because it does, it balances out the unequal heating of our earth. Okay, so we get most of our solar radiation directed towards the equator. So because of that, we need something to help balance out that heat because we don't get a lot up at the poles and we get a lot at the equator. And thus, wind helps us do that. And wind is caused by the pressure difference that comes from that unequal heating of the Earth, right? And if you remember, what is that? That's called radiation when the sun heats the Earth. And when it moves around as wind, right, right, right? We have convection. All right, and winds are named based on the direction that they are coming from. So a nor'easter, guess what, comes from the northeast. A westerly wind comes from the west. So here we go, northeast, south, west. A westerly wind comes from the west and goes to the east. So let's, ooh, ooh, southwest comes from the southwest and goes to the northeast. Two factors we're going to talk about that can affect wind are the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis effect. And so the pressure gradient force, named as such pressure, so it has to do with air pressure. And a gradient is just kind of a change over some, some period of not necessarily time, but land, anything like that. So when air pressure changes steeply or changes really quickly, our wind speed increases. And remember, we know when air pressure changes quickly because if we see a lot of these isobars next to each other, then our wind speed will increase. The closer the isobars, the higher the wind speed. And, hey, look. Oh, look at those little barbs. You should know exactly what those are. Those are parts of weather station models, right? So if we're looking off to the side here, you can see that the ones with the flags are actually the highest mile per hour. And you can see that the ones with the flags occur where the isobars are closest together. And you can see your calmer winds exist out here where the isobars are further spaced apart. So again, closely spaced isobars means lots of wind, strong pressure gradient. All right, widely spaced isobars means a little bit of wind, very light wind, weak pressure gradient. So if you're looking on here, you would characterize this as what, what, what? What's the answer? Hopefully you would tell me light winds. It's a weak pressure gradient because the isobars are so far apart. So if you were looking for a place with strong winds, you would probably say somewhere around these parts because your isobars are so close together. The Coriolis effect. This is something that happens because our Earth rotates or spins on its axis. So things in the atmosphere, it could be winds, it could be you know planes, anything like that, is influenced by this Earth's rotation, okay? So, what happens here is if we're looking down on the Earth from the North Pole, the rotation of the Earth is counterclockwise. That causes the winds in this northern hemisphere to be deflected to the right of their intended pathway. So, the dotted line is their intended pathway, but because the Earth is spinning, that, that object will actually go off to, in that direction. And you can kind of see these are all to the right of their intended pathways. So winds deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere, and it's a mere image of itself or exact opposite, so it's deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so here I have a video that kind of shows you the Coriolis effect as the Earth is moving. So it's super cool, but bear with the computer talk. I'll narrate too sometimes. Were it not for the Earth's rotation, winds and ocean currents would flow in the direction of initial movement. It's moving. But because the Earth spins, all free-moving objects, 
including masses of air, are deflected from their original direction of motion. This is called the Coriolis effect. Imagine an object launched from the North Pole toward the target on the equator. From the vantage point of the target, the object appears to be deflected. Now the flight is reversed. The object has a velocity component to the right imparted at the point of origin. The object traces a curved path to the right. Now the object is launched toward a target rotating along with the point of origin on the same parallel. The object appears to be deflected from the initial path. Deflection increases as the object covers more ground. In the southern hemisphere, rotation is clockwise when viewed from over the south pole. The effect is to deflect objects to the left from the direction of initial movement, as shown by an object launched from the pole. Again, the leftward velocity component imparted to the object from its point of origin carries it left with respect to the target. With the object and target rotating along the same parallel, flight does not follow the parallel, but an arc of circumference. As the flight changes latitude, it is progressively diverted to the left. In summary, the Coriolis effect causes objects in the northern hemisphere to be diverted to the right, as viewed from the direction of original movement. This applies to flights regardless of direction. In the southern hemisphere, the deflection is to the left. The only motions not subject to Coriolis deflection are east and west motions along the equator. Cool, the equator is special, meaning that objects are not deflected at the equator. Climate. All right, so climate is weather conditions of an area over a long period of time. And when we talk about climate, we're mainly talking about temperature and precipitation. Okay, so what we usually want to know about an area is the average temperature. So we can add up the high. To get an average, you add up the high, the low, and then divide by two. Uh, you can find average temperature for the month, for the year, anything like that. Temperature range is the difference between the highest and lowest monthly average. All right, and then the average precipitation. So about how much precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, or otherwise do you get for that month? So we can look up here. Here is a little climate graph. And our average rainfall is going to be the bars and the Temperature is the line graph section. So you can see here San Francisco. So we have, a, these are millimeters of rain, by the way. Okay, so you can see that our rainiest months are going to be January and December. And uh, the least amount of rain occurs in June, July, and August. And then you can see our temperature, how our temperature fluctuates. So you can see the lowest temperature is a little under 10, so maybe 9 or 8 uh, degrees Celsius, and our highest temperature is 16 degrees Celsius. So we're talking only a temperature range of 8 degrees Celsius, which is really not that much difference between your coldest and your hottest months. Again, here is another graph depicting a climate, and this is also of San Francisco. And our bars are also millimeters of rainfall. And our line part of the graph is going to be our temperature. So again, you can see our rainier months are January and December, with very little rainfall in June, July, and August. And then you can see how our temperature begins to fluctuate here. So the hottest month being somewhere in between September and October, and the coldest months kind of and December and January, but overall not a huge change in temperature year-round. There are certain things that will affect the climate of an area. 
like why, for instance, San Francisco doesn't have a lot of change in temperature all through the year. So one of these things that affects climate is latitude. Different latitudes receive different amounts of sunlight. So remember, latitudes are lines that go like this, and if here's my half circle, here's my equator at zero, and here's my zero degrees, here's my north pole at 90 degrees, right? If you're nearest the equator, then your climate should be warmer. And if you're closer to the North Pole, then your climate's going to be colder based upon the amount of sunlight that you're receiving. Okay? It also depends on where you are situated. So are you next to land or are you next to water? If you're situated next to water like we are, we tend to have a more moderate temperature, meaning it doesn't change as drastically. So our coldest months may be in our 30s and our hottest months may be, you know, you might see 100 degrees, okay? We are next to the water, whereas maybe if you're in like Detroit or something like that, they could get down to zero and all the way up to 100. So they have a much bigger temperature range because they're not next to the water. And this is because water heats and cools much slower than land does. Okay, land heats up fast. It also loses its heat fast. Water, think about boiling a pot of water. It takes a long time to boil that pot of water, but it does not take a long time for that coil on the stove to get hot. Okay, so topography or the lay of the land also affects your climate. Uh, things like elevation. So the higher up you are in the mountains, temperature will decrease. As elevation increases, temperature decreases. Also, depending on what side of the mountain you're on, it can affect your weather. So mountains will cause airs to rise and cool and then actually lose moisture as it passes over. So that's why you can see a desert right behind a mountain. Alright, so let's look at this graph. We're comparing two different temperatures, two different climates of areas, okay? So Juneau, Alaska is the one in red, and Edmonton, Alberta, which is in Canada, is the one in blue. So these are temperatures, so you notice who has the coldest temperatures. That would be Alberta, Edmonton, Alberta, but it also has the highest temperatures, giving it the highest temperature range because it has the most difference and compared to Juneau, Alaska. Now, Alaska. Now, if you are trying to figure out why that is, you need to look at this map down here and look at where they are situated. So, Juneau is next to the water. So, like I just told you, water heats and cools much slower than land. Okay, so it's going to take a lot longer to heat up and a lot longer to cool down as opposed to Edmonton, which is totally surrounded by land, which heats and cools really quickly. Here are two places in South America. So Quito is situated right on top of this uh, topography, and Guayaquil is situated there on the coastline. So you can kind of see that they're pretty close to water, both of them. So their temperatures don't really have a big temperature range, except that this G1 is much warmer. Now, why is it warmer? Because Quito here is situated right on top of this mountain, and as elevation increases, temperature decreases. The El Nino, or the Southern Oscillation, or when you put it together, it's ENSO, is the warming of waters in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, so right here by the equator. And right here around the equator, in normal conditions, we have these strong trade winds that will be blowing in this direction, coming from the northeast, blowing to the southwest, or coming from the southeast, blowing to the northwest. And that causes all this warm water to be pushed over here into Australia and Indonesia. Okay, so when we have warm water being pushed over there, what happens above warm water? Warm water causes that air to get a little warm, air rises, cools, condenses, we have storms and whatnot. So during an El Nino year, 
we actually our winds aren't as strong so and so that warm water will just kind of come back over to the South America side and actually it'll even affect all up into North America as well so we'll get this warm water over here on our side of things and again we have warm malt water so we have this air rising and cooling and causing lots of rain when we get lots of rain we get some flooding okay whereas over here we're gonna get some drought conditions alright so you can see in this picture over here I like it because it has clouds and I like that okay so this is during an El Nino year right we have this warm water coming back over here it's all wet we have a lot of warm air rising causing a bunch of rain so we have some floods flooding going on and whatnot over here we're gonna have some droughts alright so another reason it's bad besides getting some extra flooding and some extra rain is that uh, when this warm water moves all this you see this blue cool water here it upwells or bring all brings all these cold nutrients up to the top so all the plants and all the other stuff can get it okay when this warm water comes back you see it keeps this layer of warm water on top and we don't get this nutrient rich upwelling happening so it's not good for the algae and the plants that live there nor any of the other organisms